Okay. Yeah, so do you have some questions from last time? Anyone? Can everyone hear me and uh, see the screen? Yes, sir. Okay. Okay. So, um, Okay, so I, I guess there are no questions. So let me um, let me begin. So last time uh, we talked about Gauss lemma, and uh, so basically we saw there are two versions, uh, essentially three versions. This curler is also called Gauss lemma. So the first version was uh, was about content. So content of a polynomial is. Uh, is the GCD of all the coefficients. Yeah. So this makes sense for non-zero polynomials. So here f and g are non-zero. So uh, otherwise uh, content is undefined. Yeah. So then it doesn't make sense. Okay. So maybe one should put a cross here. Uh, just so that uh, everything makes sense. Yeah. So content of f times g is same as content of f times content of g. So this was the first version. Um, and using version one, one can uh, show that uh, if R is a UFD with fraction field K, and F is some polynomial in uh, with coefficients in R, and if you can uh, factor F uh, in Kx, in the bigger ring Kx, um, then you can factor it in the pol uh, in the in the smaller polynomial ring Rx, uh, such that the degrees match. Yeah. In fact, uh, what we can uh, what we saw is that. Uh, um, so maybe I'll, I'll write. Uh, in fact, uh, what we showed is. Uh, so. Okay. Maybe maybe in red. In fact, uh, what we showed is that uh, capital G is going to be some some uh, scale, uh, some uh, some scalar times small g. Yeah, so some uh, um, let's say uh, small a times g and uh, capital H is some b times small h where a b are elements of uh, elements of r yeah so uh, so we can in fact say that uh, g and h are uh, or in other words g and h are associates uh, capital g and small g are associates in kx that's what we can say yeah um, a and b non zero non zero for uh, elements in r so uh, we can show that, uh, so in other words, capital G and small g are associates in Kx and capital H and small h are associates in Kx. So, and from there, uh, we can conclude that if we have a polynomial of content one, uh, which, is, uh, which is same as primitive, yeah, so this content one means primitive. Um, so for example, F is a monic polynomial, yeah? Then it is irreducible in Rx if and only if it is irreducible in Kx. Okay. So if you have a content one polynomial in Rx, then it is irreducible in Rx if and only if it is irreducible in Kx. So a typical example is a monic polynomial, for instance. So these are the three versions of uh, Gauss lemma, which we saw and we saw the proof. So. Uh, so we uh, we showed that version two implies corollary, and we showed that version one implies uh, version two, and then we saw eventually the, the proof of version one. Yeah. So now maybe I'll do some examples. So uh, so uh, so first of all, uh, notice that uh, this uh, cor in corollary content one is important. Yeah. So this is not true without content one for some obvious reasons. Yeah. So for instance, uh, example, so can you give an example of a polynomial which, uh, uh, which without content one, which will, uh, con uh, which will not satisfy the conclusion of the corollary?
something like two uh, x or something. Yeah, so some something like uh, so. For instance, that three x minus six, which we had in the homework, yeah. So it's some stupid reason, yeah. So f x is three x minus six um, as uh, as an element of z x. Yeah. So this is obviously not irreducible, right? F x f x is uh, same as three times x minus two. And three is ni neither three is a unit nor x minus two is a unit. But um, but in Qx, fx. Um, um, but in but in Qx. So if you view it as Qx, then uh, then of course three becomes a unit in Qx. Yeah. So so it is irreducible. So in in Qx, every linear polynomial is um, is irreducible. Degree one polynomial is irreducible. So in particular, this three x minus six is it. So you can't factor it further. Yeah, it's degree one, so you, there is no other way to factor it. So this uh, common factor you took out is actually a unit in in Q. Okay. F x is irreducible, but this is reducible. Yeah. In Z x. Yeah. So content one is important for corollary, but not for the previous two versions. Okay. So uh, maybe I'll. I'll uh, so this is just an ex example to show why this is important. Uh, why this uh, content one is important, but uh, why uh, why is Gauss lemma useful? So uh, so it's easy to prove whether certain polynomials are uh, irreducible or not. Using um, using uh, Gauss lemma, which uh, uh, so maybe I'll do one example. Yeah. So so let's uh, let's take one example, something like uh, maybe in Q X Y. Yeah. So Q X Y, you can uh, yeah. So or you can also think of uh, or uh, maybe. Qx, y, or something like that. Some, so Qx, uh, Q round bracket x means uh, where Q round bracket x is a uh, fraction field of Qx. Okay, so when you put round bracket, it uh, it means uh, fraction field of the polynomial ring over that. Yeah, if you're working over the over the field, so you take uh, some polynomial. So, for instance, um, three uh, y square or y cube plus two uh, x y square plus seven uh, y plus three uh, x plus yeah, something like this. So you think of this uh, polynomial uh, either in either in this ring or that ring, and you ask whether this is irreducible. So is f x y irreducible? So what is your guess? Yeah, any guesses? Maybe I should take a poll. How many of you think it's irreducible? Maybe you can put it in the chat box if you think irreducible. Let's write irreducible. Or reducible, then write reducible. No guesses? 
I mean, I've written a random polynomial, so most likely it's going to be the irreducible. Yes, as you see, any random polynomial you write over QX or uh, some field like Q, it's going to be irreducible, most with high probability. But here you can you can see it's irreducible. So, so can you tell me why it is irreducible? I'm not sure about it, but I think it's linear in X, and the coefficients won't have common factors with respect to Y. Yeah, so how how would you make it formal? Um, suppose we say that it's a product of two polynomials. Ah, no, so you have to apply Gauss lemma somehow, yeah? So so you have to show it's irreducible in one of the, uh, in these two rings in some sense, yeah. So let's try to um, do this. Uh, so what we so so you notice that this is linear in X, yeah. So one should have uh, one should think of this as a polynomial with coefficient in QY, yeah. So f x y belongs to so it belongs to Q x y, but it also belongs to Q y. To round bracket y x yeah so your r is uh, q q y okay which we know is a is a pid and hence a uft yeah so r, uh, we can apply gauss lemma to this r yeah so we have this polynomial in uh, in q y x and uh, then just to uh, just for psychological reason, let's write it as a polynomial with coefficients in y. Then it becomes uh, two y square plus three x plus uh, three y square plus seven y plus five. Yeah. So it's uh, uh, it looks something like this. Yeah. And uh, uh, QY is a field, and this is a uh, this is a, a linear polynomial in X. Yeah, so this of course uh, is uh, irreducible in Q QY X. Yeah, so it's certainly irreducible if you take uh, so K the fraction field is QY, so over KX it is certainly irreducible, yeah, because it's it's a linear polynomial, so you can't factor it further, yeah. So in every linear polynomial in uh, in uh, in KX where K is a field is uh, is irreducible. Now the second uh, thing is uh, we have to look at content of this thing, yeah. So if content is one, then it's irreducible even in R uh, R. Uh, uh, Rx, yeah. So, so we'll have to check whether the content is one or not. So that means um, whether the GCD of uh, these two polynomials, two y square plus three and uh, three y square plus seven y plus five, uh, that, uh, whether the content is um, um, one or not. Yeah, so whether the GCD is a unit or not. But uh, I mean, 2y squared plus 3 we know is uh, sort of irreducible, yeah? In, in so QY. So it will be 3y cube. So, ah, ah, so I wrote something wrong, yeah? Oh, 3y cube. Oh, okay, okay, sorry. Yeah. This is 3y cube. Yeah, so it just the first factor will give us everything but let's just okay so uh, so uh, not not that the first factor itself is um, is irreducible and uh, most likely the second factor is also irreducible but uh, the point is uh, second factor you can't get it by multiplying some linear term here right because uh, I mean the uh, um, so so the the first uh, term does not uh, divide the second term. I, you can just check it um, because um, I don't know. You just multiply some linear term and you see that uh, you will never get three y square plus seven y plus five. Yeah? Or you carry out the long division if you like. I, I'm pretty sure the second factor is also um, also irreducible because I've chosen it randomly. But uh, nevertheless, you can do the long division and check that the, the GCD of these two is indeed one. Yeah. 
So you can uh, carry out the long division and see what uh, remainder you get. Okay. So um, um, uh, so you'll get some uh, uh, some remainder, and um, that will tell you that uh, you can't divide. Uh, uh, it it doesn't have this as a factor. So that tells you that uh, GCD is one, and this um, this implies um, so. 2y square plus 3 is irreducible because it doesn't have any root. Yeah, so so a degree two polynomial is irreducible whenever it doesn't have a root because the only way it can factor is uh, into linear terms. So I mean, uh, and if it factors into linear terms, then uh, it must have a root. But uh, no matter what y you plug in, you get something positive. Yeah? So this is irreducible and uh, uh, 2y square plus 3 does not divide 3y cube plus 7y plus 5. Okay, so that tells you that uh, GCD is 1. Uh, and uh, then uh, from there you can, uh, so then Gauss, Gauss lemma tells us that uh, it is irreducible. Uh, F is irreducible in qxy and hence it will be f is also irreducible so now um, since it has content one you, you can also uh, uh, conclude that it's irreducible in this this ring as well yeah now uh, here so here you use again so here also we'll use Gauss lemma So here, uh, R, R you take as QX, yeah? So again, R is a UFD. So, um, and uh, note that Q, R, Y is QXY. Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a standard trick people used to conclude. Uh, so intuitively, we, uh, we see that uh, it's linear in X, so most likely it will be irreducible as long as these coefficients are co prime, and uh, Gauss lemma allows us to make this intuition uh, uh, formal. Yeah. Any questions? Okay. So. So um, yeah, so someone already uh, someone had answered that in chat. So uh, so that's uh, an application of Gauss lemma. Another application we'll see now is uh, is this theorem that if R is a UFD, then Rx is a UFD. Yeah. So that's also an application of Gauss lemma. Okay, any, any questions before I uh, proceed to this uh, next theorem? Okay, so if there are no questions, let's, let's continue. So the next is, uh, so this will, uh, this allows us to construct many UFT rings, yeah? So all polynomial rings over a field or integers is going to be a UFT, for instance. So, so uh, you, uh, we get that, uh, uh, we can uh, we can generate many examples of UFD. PID are, are a bit restricted, but UFDs are much more prevalent. Okay, and then the, the localizations are also UFD. So you know, so you can also do localization after adjoining uh, variables, and still we get UFD. So this leads to many more examples of UFD. Okay, so let's try to prove this. So here we sort of uh, use uh, Gauss lemma multiple number of times to show that there is a factorization and it's unique. Yeah. So let uh, K be uh, the fraction field of R and Fx be an element of Rx. Uh, so maybe a non zero element of Rx, uh, non zero non unit. So, 
So I should have written that. Hmm. Assume fx is non zero non unit. Okay. Then only we claim to be able to factor it as product of irreducible. Yeah, then, uh, then first of all, we can write fx as c uh, content of f times capital fx. Yeah, uh, where capital fx is some other polynomial in rx. And uh, in fact, we know that capital F will have content one. So this is similar to the trick we did in Gauss lemma. Yeah, first basic step. So uh, now since R is U of D, uh, if content of F is, um, uh, so if content of F is not a unit, uh, if CF is not a unit, then we can write uh, content of S, F as product of irreducibles where, uh, where PIs are uh, irreducibles in R, yeah? because R is a U of D. So, so we want to uh, write a small fx as product of irreducibles in Rx. So uh, we will, what we'll do is uh, CF, we will write it as product of irreducibles uh, using the fact that R is uh, UFD this way. And uh, we will, uh, so I should, uh, so later on, I, I think I forgot to put it here. So later on, we'll show that P1 to PR are in, in fact irreducibles in, in, in Rx as well, not just in R. Which is also immediate, yeah, right? Because uh, I mean, if p p one you can factor it as product of two polynomials with coefficients in R, those polynomials must be constant polynomials, right? And that means those elements must be in R. Uh, but p i is irreducible in R uh, implies that th those two elements, one of those two elements, must be a unit. Yeah. So if p i's are irreducible in R, it's automatically irreducible in R x. Yeah, so, so, uh, so that that takes care of the content of f part, and then capital F x is an element uh, is an element of R x, but it's also contained in K x. Yeah, and uh, and uh, in K x is uh, is in fact a PID, so in particular U F D. So. Uh, so we can uh, we can factor f x in k x at least yeah so we can write f x as uh, g one x to g s x where g one to g s are in k x and they are all irreducibles yeah so now we can apply so well the Gauss lemma which we stated was for two polynomials but uh, you can uh, you can do it for finitely many polynomials yeah so by induction. So maybe I should have written this uh, parallel to this uh, this versions. Yeah, maybe I'll I'll write it because this is a uh, just for clarity. So uh, maybe I'll write it here. Good, good. Uh, so rather I don't want to put some curl every word here. It's just a note. Yeah, note. Um, fx is uh, g1 to gr in kx in version 2 then we can write fx as uh, g1 to gr in rx where capital GI is AI times small GI for some AI in, in R. Yeah, so the degree will be AI non-zero in R. Yeah, so the degree will be also same. Yeah. So this you can just do induction if you like. Yeah. So nothing deep about it. So we are using that version in some sense. Okay, so uh, so we can write uh, uh, by Gauss lemma we can write f x as uh, g one to g s and uh, 
GIs are in Rx and degree GI, in fact, we, uh, is uh, same as cap, uh, degree capital GI. In fact, uh, we know that GI, capital GI and small GI are, uh, are associates. So this means associate. Okay. Associate. Okay. Also, content of F is one. So that tells you that um, content of G1 uh, con and uh, again, say version one of Gauss Lemma. So even that is true with uh, many, many factors. Yeah? So same, same proof goes through. Or, or so you can use the, um, you can do it uh, two at a time. Yeah? So the product of uh, content of G1 to content of GS is one that tells you that uh, each, uh, each of them I have content one. So GIs are primitive uh, uh, pol uh, polynomial. And uh, GIs are irreducible in Kx. Yeah? So GIs are, uh, uh, because, uh, because little, uh, mm, uh, little GIs were irreducible in Kx, and you take a, a non-zero multiple, and uh, if you multiply it by a unit, so anything in R becomes a unit in K. So, so you multiply by a unit, it doesn't change anything. Yeah. So if little GI is irreducible, capital GI is also irreducible. And so associate of a irreducible is uh, irreducible. Yeah? So this capital GIs are primitive polynomials and also irreducible in Kx. Yeah? Then uh, of course this, uh, this is Gauss lemma, corollary to Gauss lemma. then GIs are irreducible in Rx. Yeah? So uh, if you have a primitive, and so maybe a uh, primitive is same as uh, content one. So maybe a primitive, I, C, G, I is one, yeah? So then uh, uh, the corollary to Gauss lemma says that if you have a primitive uh, polynomial irreducible in, uh, in Kx then, uh, and the polynomial belongs to Rx, then it's irreducible in Rx as well. So we get that GIs are irreducible in, in Rx. Also PIs are irreducible in R, and we already argued that they are irreducible in Rx as well. Yeah, because you can't factor it as, uh, non-constant polynomial. It has to be constant polynomial since PIs are constant. Yeah. So hence we get this factorization that uh, Fx is uh, P1 to PR times G1 to GSX can be written as a product of irreducible elements of, uh, of Rx. Okay, any questions so far? So we uh, so what we have shown is that you start with any any polynomial which is uh, uh -huh, so sorry uh, maybe some clarification is needed. Uh, one thing one has to worry about is um, whether fx is uh, yeah. So here again uh, has uh, is a U of t and uh, has fx. You can write it like this if. If fx is non-constant, if fx is non-constant, yeah. If fx is constant, then uh, basically fx is going to be a unit, yeah, because you have already factored out cf. So the, uh, then, of course, uh, there won't be any any factors. So, so here R and S, both R and S can't be zero, but one of R or S could be zero. Yeah, so that is not a problem. Okay. So technically one of R or S uh, has, uh, could be possibly zero. Is that okay? Uh, any, any questions? Okay. Okay. So this is uh, this is uh, existence, and then uniqueness is again similar. So what uh, the strategy we are using is that for the con 
content part we are using r is a uld and uh, for the uh, for the uh, primitive polynomial part we are using that kx is a uld so even for uniqueness we we can apply the same strategy yeah so so that's what uh, we will do here so for uniqueness i'm sorry for uniqueness so suppose um, we can write fx as product of q1 to qt uh, uh, and q1 to qt are irreducible in rx uh, irreducible polynomials in rx possibly constant yeah some of these qis could be constant so uh, so they will uh, um, so since qix uh, is in rx are irreducible and uh, we can write each qix as cqi times capital qix same like we did for uh, little fx where qix is in rx yeah this uh, uh, capital qix now uh, since qix is irreducible this uh, and we have we are writing it as product of two guys so one of them has to be a unit yeah so either uh, either you can say that content of qi is uh, is one or uh, or unit so the since we are doing content there are uh, they are anyway well defined up to up to associate yeah so you can say either cqi is one or qi x is one one of the uh, one of this should be true so which means uh, if qi x is one then qi is a constant or uh, the polynomial qi x is is constant if you like or qi is a primitive polynomial if cqi is one then qi is a primitive polynomial so there are only two cases either uh, either these qis are either constants or primitive polynomials uh, uh, there is nothing else for, so you can't get a polynomial which is not primitive as qis okay and even when they are uh, constant it has to be irreducible yeah so so let q so anyway all the polynomial everything here all the qis are here so, so let's say of the first n of them are constant so some of them may be constant so here n could be possibly zero and the remaining uh, uh, are are uh, are uh, non constant polynomials so they are primitive non constant polynomials yeah so uh, uh so it's possible that n is equal to t or n is equal to 0 both both possibilities are there yeah then uh, what will be c of f so c of f has to be q1 to qn right because uh, so first n of them are constant and uh, n plus 1 to uh, um, qn plus 1 to qt is primitive so their their, their contents is one so the product uh, so their product is also primitive yeah by gauss lemma so uh, gauss lemma tells you that they uh, in and the product of the remaining polynomials qn plus 1 to qt is is of is primitive so the content is just the just this uh, constant factor q1 to q okay but r is ufb yeah and uh, and cf we have written as product of irreducibles p1 to pr in r so uh, so you use the fact that r is ufd to conclude that n must be equal to r and after re reordering pi is going to be uh, uh, associate of qi yeah so here for instance if CY, cf was a was a unit that tells you that uh, n must be zero in this case yeah so all that cases is uh, is covered yeah okay so that takes care of uh, the first n factors or the constant part and uh, for the second one uh, so also this capital fx is uh, so remember uh, small fx is uh, cf times capital fx and the cf part is q1 to qn so the capital fx part is going to be the product of the remaining guys yeah so also this uh, capital fx is going to be qn plus 1x to qtx but capital fx is also product of g1 to gsx yeah so that tells you 
that uh, and they are all in kx yeah so capital qis are also in rx and hence in kx and gis are also in kx and kx uh, by definition is a pid and uh, hence a ulb and uh, and everything is irreducible gis were irreducibles and uh, qi qis are also irreducible yeah so that tells you that the number of terms here which is um, t minus n i guess is same as s or in other words t is same as n plus s yeah and after reordering we'll get some uh, uh, q n plus i is an associate of g i yeah so uh, so q n plus one uh, so we want to show that uh, mm, but associate in in kx not in we want to show that there are uh, this uniqueness up to associate in rx not in uh, in um, in kx yeah so here they are associate in r which also means that they are associate in rx implies pi is associate in qi as r associates in qi in rx yeah because uh, associate means pi is some unit times qi where unit uh, u uh, times uh, pi is some ui times qi where ui is a unit in r but something which is a unit in r is also a unit in r yeah? so this part is okay but here we will have to argue a little bit so so qn plus i and gi are associates in kx yeah so that means there is a unit in kx such that uh, 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 QNI, uh, QN plus I is uh, UI times GI, where UI is some unit in KX, and what are units in KX is K minus any non zero element of K. But how does, uh, but QI and GI are primitive, so that uh, then you can conclude UI is a unit in R. Why? Because how does UI look like? So I didn't really write down the argument here. So maybe I'll just expand a little bit here. Yeah, so how does UI look like? Yeah, so UI is going to look like AI over BI, uh, AI BI in R. Yeah, so they are the elements of R, BI non zero. Yeah, so, uh, uh, so what we get is uh, um, uh, BI times uh, qn plus i equals ai times gi but uh, remember qn plus i and gi both are primitive yeah so bi if it has some irreducible factor so you can assume ai and bi ha ha have no common irreducible factor then if bi has some irreducible factor then it has to divide uh, 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 then it has to, uh, it has to divide uh, gi yeah because it can't divide ai yeah or or maybe you can just uh, uh, do this uh, so you just ca calculate content on both take content on both sides so content uh, um, of uh, bi qi qn plus i is maybe maybe this is better this uh, content of ai gi which tells but this is bi because content of qi is one and the right hand side is ai yeah so so content uh, by the way is defined up to a unit so all this means is that uh, this is not uh, bi is equal to ai per se it's uh, i bi is an associate of ai yeah so that means the ratio which implies ai over bi or bi over ai is a unit in in R, yeah. So uh, so B I and uh, A I are uh, sort of associates in R. So this is a is a unit in R. Okay. So you get that U I is a unit in R. Okay. So that tells you that Q N plus I and uh, and G I are associates. Yeah. So we had two factorization, one P1 to PR times G1 to GSX, and uh, the other is Q1 to QT, I guess. And we saw that uh, R plus S is 
um, sorry. Yeah, R, N is same as R, yeah? So R plus S, um, so maybe I'll, I'll just, for clarity, we'll just write, write it here, which is same as R plus S. So we shall see that T is equal to indeed R plus S, and after some reordering, QIs are, uh, this P1 to PR are associated, and G1 to GS are associates with uh, one of these QIs. Okay. Is that clear, everyone? Any any questions? So so we have completed the proof, yeah. So this completes the proof that uh, uh, R is a UFD, and then Rx is a UFD. Okay, so maybe I'll just put. Yes. Sir, I had a question. Can is there a better criteria to determine whether a ring is a UFD? Like whatever we have done, the uniqueness and the the definition one as well as the equivalent criteria, both of them are equally long, to be honest. So is there a better criteria? Uh, so the, yeah, the, the other criteria is the only better criteria. I mean, uh, they, these are the two criteria I know of, yeah? So see, um, the other criteria is actually not that complicated. You have to sh basically show that every irreducible is prime. Okay. Yes. I, and uh, there is uh, that uh, every increasing chain of uh, principal ideal is uh, stabilizes. So that is true for almost all rings. Yeah. So most nice rings have have that property. So we will now study. Uh, so uh, maybe after the break, I'll start this discussion on Noetherian rings, and we'll see that uh, Noetherian rings have this property. So for Noetherian rings, uh, ring is UFD if and only if. Uh, Every irreducible is prime. Okay. okay so, so one can uh, one could have tried uh, that approach here as well, but uh, but then you'll have to since here R, R is not necessarily Noetherian, we'll have to uh, prove both criteria. So I thought uh, it's simpler to do this. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. okay. But um, yeah, this is um, there is no other reasonable criteria. Uh, yes. so that's if there was anything simpler because even in the assignment when we were to prove the localization of any uh, non-trivial localization is a UFD of a UFD. Mm -hmm. So even that one so it was a bit lengthy. <laughs> so if there was any better criteria that yeah, but there maybe the other criteria would have been simpler. But anyway, uh, yeah, it takes a bit of effort to show. I mean, uh, meaning right. Uh, so conceptually, it's not that complicated. Yeah, anything which is conceptually not complicated, you should think of it as uh, easy. Yeah, it may take time to write it down, but uh, it's okay. Okay, sir. Thank yeah. you, sir. Yeah, welcome. Sir, Any one, other questions? One thing is irreducible sir primes, and what is the second criteria you said? Every increasing chain of uh, principal ideals should uh, stabilize. So both these criteria should be, uh, both uh, the ring should satisfy both of them. Then it's a UFD. Okay. So this was one criteria which we proved. Uh, I don't know, maybe a couple lectures uh, before before localization, I think. So, uh, so we will see uh, that no, in Noetherian ring, the second property is satisfied always. Yeah. So, uh, Noetherian rings axiomatizes uh, uh, something stronger than this. Yeah. So, yeah. So, Siddharth has written something about Hilbert basis theorem. So, Hilbert basis theorem is something else. It says if R is a uh, R is Noetherian, then Rx polynomial ring over that is Noetherian. Yes, so, um, yeah. So that uh, that will imply uh, uh, this uh, uh, that if R if R has this. Uh, um, uh, so if uh, so that that ha that helps in. Uh, uh, so, uh, so, so if you know uh, R is Noetherian, then uh, Rx will be Noetherian by Hilbert basis theorem, and then uh, you can say that. Uh, so, and then if you know that irreducibles are prime, then then you're good. 
Okay. Any other questions or comments? Okay. So, so maybe we'll take a take a break and then we will reconvene in about five minutes. Yeah. Uh, let me just see what time it is. Yeah. So eleven fifty six. So maybe we'll uh, we'll reconvene in about uh, uh, at uh, twelve uh, five or something. Let's take a longer break. So let's get to uh, Noitid and Jinx. Um, are there any questions before we begin? Okay, so if there are no questions, let's uh, talk about Noitid and Jinx. So, uh, so what are uh, noiti? So noiti rings are uh, prevalent everywhere. Yeah. So those are the uh, is sort of uh, a bit of work to construct non noiti rings. Yeah. So they are most commonly found uh, rings. So it's a very big class of rings. Yeah? So most of the uh, study is done on noiti rings. Uh, so, uh, so uh, we'll uh, we'll see this proposition. So, this proposition says that uh, three statements about uh, commutative rings with unity are equivalent, and Noetherian rings are uh, uh, rings which satisfy uh, these equivalent uh, conditions. Okay. So, what are uh, what are these three conditions? Uh, so, uh, every R ideal should be finitely generated. So every ideal in this ring, a commutative to ring with unity is finitely generated. Every increasing chain of R ideals is eventually constant, which, uh, I, so this is similar to what we had in UFD, but so there we had every increasing chain of principal R ideals. Yeah? So this is, uh, this is stronger than that. So I0 contained in I1, so this means that uh, if, if we have a chain of uh, ideals I0 contained in I1 containing I2 and so on, uh, sequence of R ideals, then there exists N such that for all N greater equal capital N, I N is equal to I, um, I little N is equal to I capital N. So after N onwards, the, all the ideals are same. Capital N onwards, all the ideals are same. Or uh, in other words, you can say that if you have a strictly increasing chain of ideas, then it has to be of finite length. And that's another way of uh, saying two. Huh? And then finally, every non-empty collection of R ideals has a maximal element. Yeah. So uh, so this uh, so far uh, so in particular, uh, you don't uh, to assert that. Uh, uh, a Noetherian ring has a, uh, a non-zero Noetherian ring has a maximal ideal. You don't really need uh, Zorn's lemma. It follows uh, from the axiom of Noetherian rings as well. If you have a non-zero ring, uh, then you just take the collection of uh, uh, proper ideals, which is going to be non-empty because zero ideal will be there, and that has to have a maximal element, and hence it has a maximal. Element. So all Noetherian rings have maximal ideal, irrespective of whether you like uh, axiom of choice or not. Yeah. So uh, so these three conditions are equivalent, which we'll show in a bit. And any ring satisfy one uh, one of these equivalent conditions are called Noetherian. So if it satisfies one, then it will satisfy all of them. Yeah. Once we have shown, uh, once we have proved this proposition. Any any questions? So uh, so before going to the proof, maybe one should write down some examples. So um, examples. So of course uh, fields or PID PID every ideal is uh, in fact uh, singly generated. So in particular finite. So fields are also PID. So I guess we have gone a little uh, further. So this is, uh, th these are two examples of uh, Noetherian rings. And so far, uh, we don't know any more. Uh, but uh, 
but uh, well, localization. Uh, what you what we'll show is uh, that Hilbert basis theorem, which says that. Uh, so we will prove this later. Hilbert basis theorem, which says that R is Noetherian, implies polynomial ring over R is Noetherian. So a polynomial ring in finitely many variables is going to be Noetherian as well. Yeah, just apply and uh, do it inductively. Okay, so so that tells you that um, uh, uh, that uh, there, are, uh, there are many more examples. So uh, so uh, so the, uh, if you take polynomial ring over uh, over a field or a, or integers, uh, then they are no Ethereum rings. Uh, but they are much better than uh, they are also UFD, yeah, Noetherian UFD. But uh, uh, but Noetherian is a bigger class. So um, so uh, then it's uh, there are many good things about Noetherian. So maybe I'll come to proof in a bit. But let's just get to it. I typed it, so it's not going to. Uh, okay, maybe I can move this. Yeah. So um, so. Um, in, uh, so there are some other nice results. So for instance, uh, um, localization, uh, so you can, so it's closed under all natural operations you can think of, like localization of uh, Noetherian is uh, Noetherian. So if you take a Noetherian ring and localize with respect to a multiplicative set, then you get uh, Noetherian. Um, uh, so if R is Noetherian and I is some ideal, then uh, R mod I is Noetherian. So these are the ways we have seen, uh, 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 we, these are the ways we have constructed new rings, yeah, R mod I is Noetherian. Yeah, so any finite kind of operation you do is uh, going to be Noetherian. And uh, yeah, maybe even if you take product of rings, the, so as long as this finite product is Noetherian. Yeah, so if uh, R1 to Rn Noetherian implies their product. So these are, this is not, uh, I mean, this ring itself is not very uh, interesting, but it's uh, anyway, we get. So these are some operations we have done on rings. So this product ring is also Noetherian and so on. Okay. But of course, if you put, um, if you, uh, so one example of non-Noetherian ring is you just take polynomial with um, many, uh, polynomial ring in infinitely many variables. So then you get something which is non-Noetherian. So if you do some infinite operation, then you will go out of uh, Noetherian setup. Otherwise, most of the operations we have learned so far, we will stay in the uh, Noetherian category, Cat, uh, category of Noetherian rings, so to speak. The collection of Noetherian rings. Any, any questions? So, so note that, uh, I mean, uh, mm, uh, if you do this third and fourth operation, then uh, uh, you, even if you started with uh, an integral domain, you may not be in the category, or you may not be, uh, the resultant ring may not be an integral domain and so on, but, uh, but it's going to be Noetherian, you know, particularly R minus. So this is, uh, this is a very natural operation, this quotient ring. So we, we would really want this quotient ring to have very nice property, uh, some nice property, and this basic nice property that is no ethereum is at least present. Now, so R mod I, as you know, need not be an integral domain. If it's I, I is, for instance, not a prime ideal, then it's not going to be an integral domain, but still will be no ethereum. So it may not be U of D anything, yeah? so, but it will be, it will be no ethereum. Okay, so let's uh, let's see the proof of the, uh, this proposition that the three conditions are equivalent. So we have to show that every ideal is finitely generated implies every increasing chain of uh, 
I guess uh, are eventually constant, and then you will have to show two implies three, and then three implies one. Yeah. So let's uh, let's prove one implies two first. So. One plus two. Uh, maybe I, I can do it. Yeah, maybe maybe one in place two, I do it here. And then two in place three, I'll go on, on the next page. So uh, so one in place two. So we are assuming uh, every ideal is finitely generated. We want to show that uh, any increase in chain of ideals must uh, stabilize. So this is the sort of uh, uh, yeah, so it's not too bad. Let's let's just uh, do this. So, so let uh, um, i zero i zero i one and so on be increasing increasing sequence of uh, our ideals. So our ideals means ideals of R. Uh, so, so if you are given an increasing sequence of our ideals, if you take the union, we get an ideal. Yeah. So I is is just the union of these guys. So, so these proofs are not difficult. Yeah. Just uh, is is an ideal of R is an R ideal. Yeah. Um, by one. We know that uh, I, I has to be finitely generated. Yeah, I is generated. I is equal to x one to x n for uh, x n maybe I don't know some index. Yeah, x n for some m greater or equal one and uh, x one to x n x m in R. Yeah. But uh, yeah, so then uh, you know uh, each of these exercises are in one of these uh, i's. Uh, so let uh, so x i belongs to i, which is union of i n <coughs> and greater or equal to zero implies x i belongs to some i sub n i. Uh, and I greater equal zero for all i between one and m. Yeah. Then uh, take n to be maximum of these n i's. Yes, n i's. Then uh, uh, then uh, i is contained in i sub n because uh, because uh, i sub n since x i xi belongs to i n for all i between one and m. Yeah. It implies i n is equal, so, but i of course contains uh, n's equality. Yeah, so hence it implies i n equals i equals i n for all n greater or equal. Okay. So so that proves that uh, one uh, one is uh, one is stronger than two. Possibly stronger than two. Yeah, so one implies two. Any questions? Okay, so uh, and then uh, maybe two implies uh, three. So neither of these implications are difficult. So two implies three, we have to show that every non-empty collection of our ideals has a maximal element. 
So let uh, omega be a non-empty collection of our ideals. Yeah. And uh, suppose it doesn't have a maximal element. Yeah. Then we will uh, we, uh, we will construct a chain of uh, increase a strictly increasing chain of R ideals, uh, which will which will go forever, and uh, that will contradict to yeah. suppose omega has no maximal element. So since omega is non-empty, first of all, we can find I0. So let I0 be an element of uh, omega, yeah? Now, uh, since, uh, since I0 is uh, not, so maximal in, uh, 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 so here, uh, as a maximal element with respect to inclusion. So maybe I should have, I wrote it in that down, yeah? Maybe I'll just write it down with respect to inclusion. So I, I guess it's understood, but uh, with respect to inclusion. Okay. Maximum, uh, so this uh, um, ordering is, in, uh, the partial order is inclusion. Okay, so since I zero is not uh, is not uh, maximal, that means there is something which is bigger than I zero in omega. It's not maximal element of omega. There exists I one in omega such that I zero is contained is properly contained in I. And uh, uh, continue, continue this way to construct uh, a sequence, a sequence of our ideals. I zero properly contained in I one. Again, I one is not maximal, so you can find I two in omega such that uh, uh, it strictly contains I one and so on. But uh, this contradicts. Okay, so uh, so this contradicts two, and uh, so that proves two implies three. Sir, in this step, are we invoking axiom of choice? No, we are not. Uh, so every every uh, set has an element. So for that, we didn't use any axiom of choice, right? Every non-empty set has an element. But in the like, construction of the increasing chain, so basically we are uh, picking one uh, one ideal from the like. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so this the set of uh, uh, so what does it say? Uh, say I not is not maximal. Yeah. So you consider the subset of omega which does not uh, uh, which uh, uh, subset of omega uh, which contains ideals which properly contains I zero. Yeah, so if I naught is not maximal, this subset is non-empty, right? Yes, sir. And then you are, so any non-empty set has an element is not axiom of choice. So. In fact, axiom of choice is uh, even for countable thing you can uh, you can prove axiom of choice if you have a countable collection of sets and you want to make a set with one element in each of them. That also you can do without axiom of choice. So, so that is just method usual induction. 
So even that too doesn't require uh, uh, axiom of choice. The ordinary induction uh, follows from uh, some other axioms of uh, uh, set theory. Okay. So. Okay. So, uh, so axiom of choice is serious only when you have some uh, some uh, collection which is uh, which is not countable, uncountable collection. But here, of course, uh, even uh, induction is not there, so it's sort of uh, done. I mean, but anyway, induction here to define higher all the i's, you need induction. So anyway, induction is something which we take, uh, uh, which we take as granted. Yeah. So that's sort of axiom, it's a part of our axiom system. Can't do, can't work without induction. Okay. So that's two implies three, and let uh, let's just wrap it up with uh, three implies uh, one. It won't take long. So let uh, give me maybe six five six minutes so three implies one is also not complicated so we want to show that uh, uh, show that every ideal is finitely generated assuming that uh, every non-empty collection of our ideals has a maximal element yeah so uh, so let uh, i contained in r be be an ideal Okay, so I want to show that I is finitely generated. So let's uh, let uh, X be an element, X1 be an element of I. Yeah. Uh, so I'll have to cook up uh, something. Yeah. So uh, so let X1 be an element of I. Yeah. So if uh, if X1 uh, the ideal generated by so let's call this uh, I1. Yeah. yeah or maybe i0. Uh, so maybe let's start with x0. So x0 belongs to i. So if, uh, let's say consider i0, ideal generated by x0. If this, uh, if i0 is equal to i, then done. Because uh, then i is principal. Otherwise, you choose something in i which is not in i0. So otherwise, let let uh, x one be an element of x one be an element of i minus i zero. Let uh, i two uh, i one be the ideal generated by x zero and x one. Yeah. So note that i zero is strictly bigger than i uh, i one is strictly bigger than i zero. Yeah. And uh, this is also contained in I. So all these ideals are contained in I. Yeah. Um, uh, if uh, again, again, if uh, I one is equal to I, then then done. Otherwise, um, uh, let x2 be an element of i minus i1 and uh, and i2 be the ideal generated by x0 x1 x2 yeah continuing this way so you know where we are heading yeah continuing this way we will have a, a we construct In fact, we'll construct a chain, but uh, anyway, it doesn't matter, chain or a set, uh, construct uh, a collection. So we can contradict two as well, but we'll contradict three, uh, we will show three uh, collection um, of ideals, I0, I1, I2, and so on. Uh, if uh, if uh, if the process uh, if the process doesn't stop if the process if this process doesn't stop then stop 
So node uh, st uh, stop then omega is this uh, take omega to be in this chain of ideas, uh, this collection of ideas is, is a non-empty collection of ideas. of ideas with no maximal elements. No maximal elements. Because actually it's a chain, it's a strictly increasing chain, yeah? Sense. So maybe I forgot to write it down. I0 is actually properly contained in I1 because X1 does not belong to I0, yeah? And uh, I2 is properly contained in uh, I1 is properly contained in I2 and so on. Yeah. So you don't get a maximal guy in omega. Okay. Contradicting three. So, so this process has to stop somewhere. So the contradiction came from the assumption that uh, the process doesn't stop. And if the process stops, then it's finitely generated. Yeah. Is that uh, is that clear? Okay. So, so there won't be any class tomorrow. Yeah. So we'll take a break for for eat like we did it for the setup. So there won't, and, and anyways, uh, uh, sorry, we took a break for the Dasera and also for uh, October 2nd. So there won't be any class tomorrow. We'll, uh, next time when we'll meet, uh, we'll be on Tuesday. So, yeah. Uh, any other, uh, any other questions? Okay, so so I guess this is all we have uh, we have today, and uh, next time we will see some more properties of. Uh, so maybe we'll prove Hilbert basis theorem and then go on to modules. Okay, okay, so let's stop.